first five books in the Old Testament, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Let's go. Genesis 1 through 4, essential foundations for prayer. In these chapters, we learn about the nature of God, the God we pray to. Genesis 1, he's the supreme creator of all, the sovereign king above all. In Genesis 2, we learn that he is the righteous judge of all, and he is the merciful savior of all who trust in him. God, we praise you. You are the supreme creator, sovereign king, righteous judge, and merciful savior. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So that leads to what these chapters teach us about the nature of men and women. So according to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we are created in the image of God, unlike anything else in all creation, a unique reflection of God, utterly reliant upon God, and ultimately responsible to God. That leads to verse 28, where we see that we are created for the purpose of God. And that purpose is, check this out, to enjoy a relationship with God. Amen. You put this together, you realize we have been created uniquely to know God. We've been created to pursue God in a way that plants and animals, mountains and seas, stars and planets don't. Like plants and stars don't talk with God, walk with God, relate to God like you and I can. We have been created uniquely to enjoy the blessing of a relationship with God. We've been created to rule over the rest of creation as God's image bearers and reflect and multiply God's glory to the ends of the earth. The problem, however, is the nature of sin and how sin has marred our relationship with God. Genesis 3, we learn that we are spiritual beings in a natural, material world, and we are in a spiritual battle. Satan is real. From the third chapter of the Bible, we learn that Satan can speak and he is smart. He's a malicious liar and an evil murderer. And we, our hearts, are full of iniquity. We are full of iniquity, sin. Romans 5, 12 makes clear that this story in the beginning of the Bible is not just about Adam and Eve, it's about you and me. We all question God's word, we doubt God's love, and we all choose our ways over God's ways. And it's not just our sins here and there, it's our nature to sin, to turn aside from this relationship with God to ourselves, which means we all need a faithful intercessor. A faithful intercessor, which God promises in Genesis 3, 15. God promises one to come who is fully like us, the offspring of Eve, one who is fully like God, sinless, one who will redeem us from our rebellion against God by conquering sin, Satan, and death, and one who will restore us into a relationship with God, which leads to the nature of salvation. Picture we see from the beginning of the Bible, starting in Genesis 3, 8, God seeks the guilty. Don't miss this. Men and women are hiding from God in their sin. God comes to them. This is so different than the religions of the world. We are told to do all these things in order to get to God. Pray this many times a day, travel to that place, bow in this direction, give that offering. You might think, wait a minute, isn't the topic tonight the pursuit of God? Doesn't the Bible teach that we need to pursue God in different ways? And yes, it does, but we must see this from the beginning of the Bible. This is so critical. Please don't miss this. Don't fall asleep yet. So follow this. I, I shared this last Sunday at uh, the church here where my six-year-old uh, has, has recently, like whenever something is really important in his mind, he'll say, Dad, this is Hugh Massive. So I'm channeling my six-year-old right now, and I'm saying to you, this is Hugh Massive. Don't miss this. A relationship with God begins not with our pursuit of him, but with his pursuit of us. Amen. Your relationship with God begins not with your pursuit of God, but with his pursuit of you. I love the way Spurgeon puts this, reflecting on how he came to faith in Jesus. He said, when I was coming to Christ, I thought I was doing it all myself. And though I had sought the Lord earnestly, I had no idea the Lord was seeking me. I do not think the young convert is at first aware of this. I can recall the very day and hour from when first I received those truths in my own soul, when they were, as John Bunyan said, burnt into my heart as with a hot iron. And I can recollect how I felt that I had grown on a, sudden, on a sudden from a babe into a man, that I had made progress in scriptural knowledge though having found, through having found once and for all the clue to the truth of God. So follow this. One weeknight, when I was sitting in the house of God, I was not thinking much about the preacher's sermon. Hopefully you're not there right now. But... <laughs> The thought struck me, Spurgeon said, how did you come to be a Christian? I sought the Lord. But how did you come to seek the Lord? The truth flashed across my mind in a moment. I should not have sought him unless there had been some previous influence in my mind to make me seek him. I prayed, thought I, but then asked myself, how came I to pray? I was induced to pray by reading the scriptures. How came I to read the scriptures? I did read them, but what led me to do so? Then in a moment, I saw that God was at the bottom of it all, that he was the author of my faith. And so the doctrine of grace was open to me, and from that doctrine I have not departed to this day, and I desire to make this my constant confession. I ascribe my change wholly to God. Your pursuit of God begins with his pursuit of you, and it continues that way. So relationship with God continues because of God's personal, faithful, perpetual pursuit of us. Ah, oh, don't miss this. The God who pursued you out of love in the past has not 
stopped pursuing you out of love for you today. I think of so many times when I have wandered from God and praise God, he has not stopped chasing after me. I'm, I'm guessing there are some people who are part of this tonight, either in this room, via simulcast. Like, if you're honest, you are far from God. For a while now, you've not lacked any real desire for God. Little to no evidence of a pursuit of God in your life personally right now. But God, even in bringing you to this night, even in this moment, is saying to you, I am pursuing you. God is saying, I love you. I desire a relationship with you. The supreme creator and sovereign king of the universe is saying this to you right now. That will knock you out of your seat if you really think about it. Let it knock you out of your seat and onto your knees to pursue him. Why? Because God is pursuing you. God seeks the guilty. God covers the shameful, which is exactly what we see in Genesis 3, 21. Above that, we learn here that purity of heart is essential to be in the presence of God. So covering for sin is necessary. Specifically, sacrifice for sin is necessary to experience communion with God. Genesis 3, 21 is the first evidence we see of death in the Bible. But it wasn't the death of Adam and Eve. It was the death of an animal whose skin was used to cover over Adam and Eve's shame. And the verses that follow show us how God protects the fearful. He protects the fearful. God removes Adam and Eve from the garden so they might not live forever in the state of separation from him. We learn here that God's grace alone keeps us from experiencing his eternal wrath. You see this quote from George Lyle, a slave who ended up becoming the first missionary to go out from America that we know of. He said, I saw my condemnation in my own heart and I found no way wherein I could escape the damnation of hell only through the merits of my dying Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's grace alone keeps us from experiencing God's eternal wrath and God's grace alone allows us to enjoy his eternal love. So this next quote was from Lyle's chief assistant. You see that quote from him there. So let me, let me pause for a minute. I know we're starting to get into it, but I just want to ask before we go any further, every person within the sound of my voice, are you trusting in Jesus right now as the Savior of your sin and the Lord of your life? And if, if your heart does not leap with resounding yes, when I ask that, I want to invite you, urge you to put your trust in him, like right now. Like before we go any further, you cannot have relationship with God. Come to God in prayer on your own. Can't do it. You have sinned against God. You are separated from God, and you, we all, deserve judgment for our sin. The only way any one of us can come before God is by trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus for our sin. That's how a relationship with God begins. Not by doing anything to pursue him. Not by praying a certain amount of times, doing a certain number of good things to try to outweigh the bad, anything like that. The way you come to God is first and foremost by believing that he has pursued you by believing that he has sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sin so you can be forgiven of your sin, you can be restored to a relationship with him. And I wanna invite you, like right now in your heart, to say yes to Jesus if that has not been a reality. To say yes to Jesus as the savior of your sin and the Lord of your life. So it would be a mistake to move on tonight without pausing at the start and just giving you an opportunity to pray. So. Almost like, let's put our pins down for a minute and let's do that. So will you bow your heads with me on this one? So that you can focus between you and God. Every single person in this room, wherever you're sitting, like, are you, right where you're sitting, are you trusting right now in Jesus as the Savior and Lord of your life? And if the answer to that question is not a resounding yes, then I want to invite you to pray right now. Just say to God, I am a sinner and I need you to save me. Just say to God, I praise you for pursuing me. I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin, and rose from the grave in victory over sin and death. So tonight, I place my faith in Jesus as my savior. Tonight, I place my faith in Jesus as the Lord of my life. I want to be restored to a relationship with you. I want to know you. I want to enjoy you. I want to love you, God. I want to pursue you with all my heart based on your pursuit of me. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen.
It's, that's, that's where it all starts. And by the way, this is why we pray in Jesus' name. Because Jesus is the one who makes it possible for us to pray. Apart from Jesus, we are not allowed to be in the presence of a holy God. So I pray that many people, even just now, trusted in Jesus as Savior. And Lord, I run into people at different places who say they came to Christ at Secret Church. And, and some who, uh, who thought maybe they were Christians coming into a night like this, but realized that they didn't have a relationship with Christ and their eyes were open. I pray that your that eyes are being opened. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, if that's you, to share that with somebody at the break. Like, don't keep that to yourself. That leads us back to these initial chapters of Genesis, specifically chapter 4, where we see the need for prayer. So the end of Genesis 3, man and woman, Adam and Eve, separated from God in their sin. We begin to see their need for restoration to God amidst sin and temptation. The Lord said to Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So we see here how the appeal of sin and selfishness is strong before us, all of us. That leads Cain to murder his brother Abel. Strong before us, an antidote to sin and selfishness is seeking God above us. That's how Genesis 4 ends. Verse 26, to Seth also a son was born. He called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So Genesis 4 ends with people calling on the name of the Lord, praying. God, teach us to call upon your name. That leads to God's covenant relationship with Abraham in Genesis 12, 15, and 17, two realities at the heart of communion with God. In Genesis 12, God graciously speaks to Abram an idolater in the wilderness. And through God's pursuit of Abram, we learn that God provides direction for us and God makes promises to us. Genesis 12, 15, and 17 all involve promises that God graciously makes to Abram, exemplified in Genesis 17, 1 through 8 there. The whole picture is, as God graciously speaks, we gladly submit to his word, his promises, his direction. We take radical risks, like we see Abraham doing in Genesis 22 when God tells him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, that's a test. And Abraham shows that he trusts God, and God proves faithful by providing a sacrifice instead of Isaac. So the pursuit of God involves taking risks and trusting in his reward. We take a radical risk, risk and we trust in radical reward. What I love about Genesis 15, and why I put it here, is because of verse 1. So God is promising Abram descendants and land and blessing, but notice what God says at the start. He says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Do you hear that? I am your shield. God says to Abram, and the language is literally, I am your very great reward. So our trust in God is not just in his plans for us, but primarily in his satisfaction of us. And this is so key to understanding prayer rightly, because our goal in prayer is not ultimately to get things from God. Our goal in prayer is ultimately to know, love, and enjoy God. C.S. Lewis said it really well. He said, prayer in the sense of petition, asking for things, is a small part of it. Confession and penitence are its threshold. Adoration, its sanctuary. The presence and vision and enjoyment of God, its bread and wine. The great purpose of prayer is to come humbly, expectantly, and because of Jesus, boldly into the conscious presence of God, to relate to him, talk with him, and ultimately enjoy him as our great treasure. So when we think about prayer, we need to realize that getting things is not our greatest goal. Knowing God is our greatest goal. Relating to God, enjoying God is our great treasure. This is what prayer is all about. Prayer will not be very satisfying if you just want things. Maybe another way to put that, prayer will not be very satisfying if you don't want God. Prayer is the pursuit of God, not just his gifts. Prayer is the pursuit of God over and above his gifts. If we just want gifts and we don't want God, we will completely skew prayer from the start. So God, help us to seek you. We want to be satisfied in you. To see you as our treasure, as our great reward, we want to pursue you far over and above your gifts. We need you, God, to teach us to pursue you and find our reward in you. We are a materialistic people who are always looking for things. We pray that you, we would see that you are far greater than everything this world could ever offer us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean we don't ask for things, for ourselves, for others. So look at Genesis 18. It teaches about the privilege of intercession. 
In this passage, God has told Abraham that he's about to destroy Sodom. Abraham responds by pleading on behalf of the people in Sodom. Let's read this passage. Follow along. The men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find Sodom, at Sodom, 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? He said, I will not destroy it if I, will find, if I find 45 there. And again, he spoke to him and said, Support, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak, suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, let the Lord not be angry, and I will speak again, but this one. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now just think about what we learn about prayer here. How in prayer we approach God on behalf of those in need. Like we have the privilege of standing in the gap, talking to God on behalf of others. As we do, we appeal to God on the basis of his character, based on his justice and mercy. And based on his character, we present our request to God with boldness. Notice how God doesn't say in this passage, Abraham, who do you think you are asking me for mercy on this people? No, God keeps listening to him and responding, answering, as Abraham makes bold requests, but with humility. So this is the key in prayer, bold humility. We present our request to God with boldness. At the same time, we trust the response of God with humility. What a powerful picture of prayer. God, teach us to intercede for others in need based upon your character with bold humility. And then Genesis 20, a prayer for healing. Abraham prays for God to heal Abimelech, and God answers. The Bible clearly teaches God is absolutely able to heal, and God could have done this apart from prayer, but it's Abraham's intercession that leads to God's intervention. Now, we're not going to stop here and spend a ton of time on all the Bible teaches about healing. The point is to see these passages for what they're pr plainly teaching us. We'll keep moving until we get a holistic picture of what the Bible says about, for example, praying for healing. But suffice to pray, God, we praise you. You have power to heal. Anyone of anything. And we pray that you would teach us to pray with faith in your power and believing that our intercession leads to your intervention in potentially miraculous ways. Help us to pray with faith like that. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 24 is a prayer for help. As Abraham's servant prepares to go and find a wife for Isaac, as we read this passage, we learn that we pray to God for help in specific ways. The servant prays specifically for God to show him who should be Isaac's wife, and God answers. This is not, by the way, a prescription for the single guys in the room to figure out who, who she is. But anyway, the whole picture, God makes clear who Isaac should marry, and Abraham's servant bows down in worship. We praise God for help in specific ways. I love this. He bowed down and praised God as soon as it happened. It is always good when we pray to God for help in specific ways, and then we praise God when he answers in specific ways. When I was reading this passage a couple months ago, I was just compelled. In my time of the Lord, I just stopped and just started praising God for specific ways he's answered prayers in my life. He's led my life like, God, we praise you, not just for hearing our cries for help, but you answer our cries for help. Amen. That leads us to Genesis 32 and a powerful picture of wrestling with God through prayer. So read this story with me. Pick up about the third sentence. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. And so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose up as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Oh, so much here. Just think about all this passage teaches us. Like one, we experience personal interaction with God. Like you and I, in prayer, experience personal interaction with God. This is breathtaking. Two, in prayer, we plead persistently for blessing from God. Jacob says, I'm not letting go unless you bless me. <laughs> what is that about? <laughs> Can you speak like that to God? Apparently so. This is prayer, pleading for God's blessing. 
His help, his provision. I'm not going to let go. I love this quote from Samuel Chadwick. Great grief prays with great earnestness. Prayer is not a collection of balanced phrases. It is the pouring out of the soul. What is love if it not be fiery? What are prayers if the heart be not ablaze? They are the battles of the soul. In them men wrestle with principalities and powers. The prayer that prevails is not the work of lips and fingertips. It is the cry of a broken heart and the travail of a stricken soul. Is, is that how you pray? I'm guessing that many, if not most of us, read that and think, I, I, I don't pray like that. Like, let tonight change that. Let tonight lead you to pray like that, like with earnestness, with your heart set ablaze. Third, we confess our sinfulness honestly before God. And that's part of the point here. When did the blessing come? When Jacob acknowledged his name, which if you'll remember means cheater or conniver, which is what he'd been doing all his life long. And it's once he confesses that that God answers his prayer, which leads to this great quote from John Stott that I think will help us understand this passage. Stott says in prayer, we do not prevail on God, but rather prevail on ourselves to submit to God. True, the language of prevailing on God is often used in regard to prayer, but it's an accommodation to human weakness. Even when Jacob prevailed on God, what really happened is that God prevailed over him, bringing him to the point of surrender when he was able to receive the blessing which God had all the time been longing to give him. And that's the beauty here. As a result of prayer, we walk away having been changed by God. Prayer literally, like physically, changes Jacob. And prayer literally, not always physically, changes us as we take hold of the blessing of God that God wants to give. This is the beauty, don't miss this. God wants to bless us. He wants to bless his people. He invites us to experience his blessing through prayer, which means in the words of Phillips Brooks, prayer is not conquering God's reluctance, but taking hold of God's willingness. Are you seeing this? Like prayer is personal interaction with God, persistent pleading with God, honest confession that leads to total change. Like prayer is so much more than just saying a few words before you eat a meal. It's passionately prevailing with the God of the universe. <laughs> we can stop here tonight and just camp out and be done. <laughs> but we're not, because we're only on number six. Well, we're, we're like one book into the Bible. This is not amazing. God, please teach us to prevail with you in prayer, in Jesus' name. <laughs> number seven, Exodus three and six. So who is this God we pursue? And I included these texts where Moses conversed with God in a burning bush in Exodus 3, then again in Exodus 6. Not, be, not just because this involved conversation with God, but because this is one of the most significant revelations of God in the entire Bible. It's where God reveals himself to as the I am. Tozer writes, it's not a cheerful thought that millions of us who live in a land of Bibles, who belong to churches and labor to promote the Christian religion, may yet pass our whole life on this earth without once having thought or tried to think seriously about the being of God. Few of us have let our hearts gaze in wonder at the I am, the self-existent self back of which no creature can think. Such thoughts are too painful for us. We prefer to think where we'll do more good, about how to build a better mousetrap, for instance, how to make two blades of grass grow where one grew before. And for this, we're now paying a too heavy price in the secularization of our religion and the decay of our inner lives. If we're gonna grasp the wonder of prayer, we need to feel the wonder of the one we're praying to. Like, think about it, if you have a conversation with a chicken, you don't think that's very wonderful. You think that's very weird. If you have a conversation with another person, depending on who it is, you might think it's wonderful. If you have a conversation with God, you should walk away saying, that is wonderful. If you realize who God is, if you realize he is holy, he's holy, let's read the passage. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take off your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. Like when you and I pray, well, you're praying to the God who is perfectly unique, completely separate, and absolutely pure. There is no one like him anywhere in all the universe. He is holy. He is holy. He is merciful. The whole point here in Exodus 3 is that while God is holy, he is not distant from us. God sees our affliction, hears our cries, knows our sufferings, and God remembers his covenant, his promises to us. So here it's promises he made in Genesis 15 to his people that he re references in Exodus 3. God is ever present. God is all powerful. In prayer, you're talking to the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. All powerful, he is self-existent. So Exodus 3:14 is when God reveals his name to Moses. Moses asks, who will I tell them sent me to you? God says, I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent me to you. That name, Yahweh, 
from the Hebrew verb to be appears over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. Every time you see the word Lord in all caps in your Bible, that's Yahweh, the I am, the God who has no origin. You have an origin, I have an origin, God has no origin. He is self-existent, he is self-sufficient. You have needs, I have needs, God has no needs. God doesn't need us or anyone or anything else. Psalms 50 makes that clear. Tozer says, we're all human beings suddenly to become blind. Still the sun would shine by day and the stars by night. For these owe nothing to the millions who benefit from their light. So were every man on earth to become an atheist, it could not affect God in any way. He is what he is in himself without regard to any other. To believe in him adds nothing to his perfections. To doubt him takes nothing away. For God to be the I am means that he is eternal. He was, he is, and he always will be. Like a bush that burns perpetually, his glory never dims and his beauty never fades. This is awesome. This, this is why prayer to God never gets boring. Think about it. If God's beauty, his love, his glory are infinite and eternal, then that means for all of eternity, we will discover more and more and more beauty and love and glory in God. Steve, Stephen Sharnock wrote a massive, thick masterpiece on the eternity of God. I've summed it up here in one of my favorite par- paragraphs in any book anywhere. He wrote, when we enjoy God, we enjoy him in his eternity without any flux. After many ages, the joy will be, joys will be as savory and satisfying as if they had been that moment first tasted by our hungry appetites. When the glory of the Lord shall rise upon you, it shall be so far from ever setting that after millions of years are expired, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, the sun and the light of whose countenance you shall live shall be as bright as at the first appearance. He will be so far from ceasing to flow that he will flow as strong, as full, as at the first communication of himself in glory to the creature. God God is always vigorous and flourishing, a pure act of life, sparkling new and fresh rays of life and light to the creature, flourishing with a perpetual spring, contenting the most capacious desire, forming your interest, pleasure, and satisfaction with an infinite variety. Without any change or succession, he will have variety to increase delights and eternity to perpetuate them. This will be the fruit of an enjoyment of an infinite and eternal God. Oh, God never gets old boring, or uninteresting. His glory has no bounds. And when you pray, tomorrow morning, there will be more glory to be seen. And the next morning, more glory. And 10 trillion years from now, more glory, more glory. Like, it just gets better every single day. (laughs) He is immutable. His perfections never change. We'll talk more about that later. He is faithful. In Exodus 6, God refers to himself as the Lord. He makes promise after promise after promise. He promises liberation, redemption, adoption, possession. The I am is sovereign. He's in control in Exodus 3. He guarantees his people will be delivered out of slavery in Egypt. That guarantee is grounded in God's sovereignty. He's just. So when we pray, like the Israelites in their slavery, we may be tempted to doubt or question God's justice, why he doesn't answer in this way at this time, but we must be careful not to evaluate God's justice in the short term. We must be confident that God will assert his justice ultimately and completely in his perfect time. For he is God. He is God. And realizing who God is changes everything about prayer. Listen to these words from A.W. Pink. Let them soak in. Most Christians expect little from God, ask little, and therefore receive little, and are content with little. Oh God, please give us a high view of you that leads to asking for great things from you. Please deliver us from our small small views of who you are that lead to such little faith in prayer. God, help us to see you as the great I am and to ask of you, to expect you, to show your greatness in glorious ways in our lives, in our families, in our churches, and in the world around us. Help us to ask for great and receive great from your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Keep going to Exodus 16, 17. We're created to crave. So these are stories of God's people once they left Egypt, craving water and food. We're reminded in these stories that God created us with physical cravings, which he didn't have to do. God didn't have to create us in such a way that we need to drink water for sustenance or eat food. But God created us with these physical cravings for a reason. Our physical cravings are designed to be satisfied by our creator. God created our physical cravings to cause us to look to him for their fulfillment. That we might see God as the giver of all good gifts. You look at Exodus 16, 15, when they were asking, what's this food on the ground? You look at the end of that passage. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. God is the one who gives you food to eat. He is the provider for our daily needs, which is why in these next verses, God tells them to gather enough for that day's needs, but don't keep leftovers. Instead, trust God to provide day by day by day. He is the provider for our daily needs, and he's our sustainer throughout all generations. This would go down in history in the history of God's people as a lesson that God provides for his people. So see the relationship here between the physical and the spiritual. God uses our physical cravings to teach us about spiritual sustenance. 
God uses physical cravings to teach us that we are ultimately sustained by who? Not by food, not by water, but by God. God uses these episodes in the life of his people to show them and us that our spiritual need for God is far more fundamental than our physical need for food and water. Listen to Deuteronomy 8.3. God humbled you, let you hunger, fed you with manna, which you did not know nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live on bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The clear teaching of Exodus 16 and 17 is that we ultimately have life, not because of natural selection, but because of supernatural provision. And this, as we'll see, has huge implications for prayer because we need God more than we need food and water. That will have huge implications for fasting, where we let our physical craving for food drive us to a deeper craving for God. Oh God, you are our provider, our sustainer. You are the one who alone can satisfy all of our needs and all of our wants, and we worship you. We depend on you. We need you. We need you more than we need breakfast or lunch or dinner or anything else in this world, we need you. And we praise you for your faithfulness to provide for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That leads to one of the most baffling passages in all the Old Testament on prayer, Exodus 32, where we are confronted with the question, does prayer change God's mind? For that matter, does prayer really change anything? I mean, if God is sovereign, God's in control of all things, and all of God's promises will come to pass, then why pray? Does prayer really change anything? including God's mind. Like you look at this passage, we'll pick up about midway through in verse seven. Here's the setup. God meeting with Moses on Mount Sinai, giving his law to his people, including the 10 commandments. Meanwhile, God's people, the Israelites, were down at the bottom of the mountain, indulging in idolatry and immorality, worshiping a golden calf. So that's happening at the bottom of the mountain. God says this to Moses at the top of the mountain. About halfway through, the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They've made for themselves a golden calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, follow this. I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains, to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he'd spoken of bringing on his people. What is that about? That God relented? God didn't do what he was going to do? Like that, that word relented, it's translated in some Bibles, God changed his mind. It's the same word that's used in other places in Scripture to describe how people change their mind. The problem is it's also used in some places in Scripture, like Numbers 23, to describe how God doesn't change his mind. So what's happening here? Did God change his mind or not? In order to answer that question, I want to show you four truths Moses knows that we need to know. So follow this. Number one, the perfections of God are unchanging. When I use the word perfections there, I'm referring to the perfect attributes of God, which never change. God is perfectly holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6.3. He's perfectly loving. God is love, 1 John 4.16. He's perfectly just, Deuteronomy 32.4. We can go on and on. God is perfectly omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. God is perfectly self-existent, self-sufficient. And all of these attributes, God says in Malachi 3.6, I, the Lord, do not change. He does not change like shifting shadows, James 1.17. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm 90, he is God. The perfections of God are unchanging, and Moses knows this. You look at his prayer from the start in verse 11, he says, O Lord, he uses Yahweh, the covenant name for God, and as his prayer unfolds, Moses is acknowledging so many of God's attributes. He acknowledges God's wrath while appealing to God's love, acknowledges God's might while appealing to God's mercy, acknowledges God's glory while pleading for God's goodness. So we need to know what Moses knows. God's perfections are unchanging. The purposes of God are unchanging. Number two, again, Moses appeals to God's unchanging purposes. He said, you brought your people out of Egypt for your praise among the Egyptians. Your purpose was not to kill them, but to save them for your name's sake among the nations. And that purpose, Moses says, has not changed. Moses is relaying here what we know from the rest of God's word. You look at some of these passages, Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Isaiah 46, my counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken, I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, I will do it. The purposes of God are unchanging. Third, the promises of God are unchanging. So how about verse 13 for boldness in Moses? He says, remember to God. (laughs) Remember to the omniscient God who knows everything. 
Moses has the appalling audacity to say to God, maybe you need to remember something. (laughs) Remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? Moses points to the patriarchs and says to God, you promised that you would give their family the land into which you're leading them. You cannot go back on your word. Moses knows, Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, or son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and he will not do it, or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Psalm 89, I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. So you just pause for a minute here and think about this. So in this passage that sparks a lot of questions about what changes in God, Moses actually bases his entire prayer on that which never changes in God. But that brings us to verse 14 where the Bible tells us the Lord relented from the disaster he's spoken of bringing on his people. So what does that mean? Because amidst all that is unchanging in God, it certainly seems like something changed here. And that leads to this fourth truth we need to know. Because while God's perfections, purposes, and promises are unchanging, the plans of God are unfolding. Which, I want to be clear, doesn't mean God's plan is changing, as if God was surprised by Moses' prayer here and decided to change his plans. God's plan is just as settled here as it is anywhere in history. But we have this story for a reason, because this story shows us how God's plan unfolds. Follow follow this. The story shows us how God judges people in their sin. The people of Israel had sinned against God, seriously. And God says they have turned away. They're stiff-necked. They're worthy of destruction, of death. That's, That's true. Remember. Remember, this is the unchanging character of God. He is holy. He will judge people in their sin. Sin is an infinite offense in his sight. Sin warrants his wrath. So verses 9 and 10 in Exodus 32, we see God judges people in their sin. But then, then... God provides a mediator for those sinners. That's the whole picture that Exodus has given us to this point. Moses is the covenant mediator, the one who goes back and forth between God and his people, the one who stands before the people on God's behalf and before God on the people's behalf, and God is the one who set it up that way. So when you get to Exodus 32, you look back in verse 7, God says to Moses, go down to your people. Think about it. If God was going to destroy the Israelites on the spot, then why did he send Moses, the mediator, down? God was planning to spare his people through Moses' mediation. The reality of Exodus 32 is crystal clear. God will demonstrate his judgment against the people unless, 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 unless somebody steps in and mediates on their behalf. And all of this squares with the unchanging perfections of God. God is holy and just. He will punish sin. At the same time, God is loving and merciful. He will be true to his promises for his people. So how does God do it? How is God true to his unchanging perfections and his unchanging promises while fulfilling his unchanging purposes? God does it through an unfolding plan. He appoints a mediator to stand in the gap for sinners to pray for them. And as Moses prays, so follow this, Moses, as he prays, is not changing God's plan. As he prays, Moses is fulfilling God's plan. Now, that may sound a little confusing, but just think about other stories where we see this in the Bible. Think about Jonah. God sent Jonah to Nineveh to proclaim, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Nineveh is going to be destroyed because of their sin in 40 days. That's what God said. At the same time, what did God do? God sent a prophet to tell them that. Why would God do that? It's the same picture we're seeing here. God was judging the Ninevites in their sin. At the same time, he was sending a preacher to warn them so that Jonah, after spending a few days in the belly of a fish, does in fact warn them. And Jonah 3.10 says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. It's the same picture we see in Exodus 32. God judges sin, and he provides a mediator that leads to salvation. But you think about it. We don't ultimately look to Jonah to figure this one out. We look to Jesus. This is the gospel. In our sin, you and I stand under the judgment of a holy God. The just and right payment for our sin is death that we deserve. But, but, praise be to God and his unfolding plan, he has provided a mediator. God said to his son, go down, Jesus. Go down because my people have become corrupt. They have turned away from me in idolatry and immorality. And unless somebody stands in the gap for them, they will all experience my judgment. And Jesus comes down. He stands in the gap as a substitute for sinners. And by the plan of God, because of Jesus' death on the cross for you and me, hallelujah, God relents his wrath from us. In the words of 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So, what does all this teach us about prayer? Four lessons we learn. One, God has designed prayer to be a powerful means by which we participate in his plans in the world. God didn't have to design it this way. Like, God has no needs. God can accomplish his purposes without us. But don't miss this. In prayer, God is inviting you and me to participate with him and his plans that he's accomplishing in the world. This is amazing. Do you get what Exodus 32 is teaching? God brings about remarkable change in the world in response to the prayers of his people. When we pray, God acts. 
our prayers affect the way God acts in the world. I didn't put it in your study guide, but listen to Exodus 8, 13. It says, the Lord did according to the word of Moses. <laughs> like, God did according to man's word. <laughs> what a testimony to prayer. Prayer is an invitation to join with God in effectively shaping the course of history. I'm not making this up. This is all over the Bible. Like, people pray, we're going to see it. Fire falls from heaven when people pray. People pray the lame walk, the hungry eat, the dead come to life when people pray. We see this in the church in Acts. Every major move in the book, and then that book, well, I shouldn't be getting, jumping ahead. Anyway, comes in response to the prayers of God's people. Get it, get it through prayer. God has called you and me not to watch history, but to shape history for the glory of his great name. Oh, that'll change the way you pray. Like, this is not just thank you for some food. Like, yes, it's that and so much more. So God, help us to see this. Help us to believe this. Help us to join with you in shaping, the, shaping history for the glory of your name. We pray for people right now who are under your wrath. Please relent and save them, we pray. We pray for people groups right now who have not been reached with the gospel. They're under your wrath. You love them. You paid the price, Jesus, for their sin. Show your salvation among them, we pray. We pray for the spread of your salvation. This city where I'm standing, in our capital, and cities and communities all across the world where we're gathered, God, we pray, show your salvation and use our prayers, we pray, as a means by which your wrath is relented and your mercy is poured out on people around us, peoples around the world. God, teach us to pray like Moses, believing this is possible. In Jesus' name. Amen. May it be so. It just gets better in Exodus 33. That the reason for prayer First three verses, God says, okay, you can go in the promised land, Moses, but I'm not going to go with you. You're going to go alone, which prompts Moses to pray. Or we see at least four reasons to pray. One, we pray because we have an assignment we cannot fulfill. Moses says, you're telling me to lead these people in the promised land? I can't do that without you. And the reality is none of us can be the man, woman, single husband, wife, parent, neighbor, coworker, witness that God has called us to be on our own. <laughs> Heather and I lay awake at night. It seems like most nights praying, God, we have no idea how to parent. We need your help. And... This is the way it's designed to be. Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's a massive moment when you and I realize that we can't do anything apart from God's help. That's what drives us to pray. That's why Phillips Brooks said, do not pray for easy lives, pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, pray for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be a miracle. Every day you shall wonder at yourself at the richness of life which has come to you by the grace of God. Don't you wanna live that way? That rich life is unlocked through prayer because God is giving you assignments all day long, every day that you can't fulfill. We pray because we have a privilege we can't forsake. I love this story in Exodus 33, seven. Get this picture. Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord to go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp, whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. And the Lord used to speak to Moses. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face to the man speak to his friend. You get that picture. Like imagine the whole congregation of Israel, thousands and thousands of people camped, all ages. They hear that Moses is going to meet with God and everybody comes out and stands in front of their tent. Like, as, like thousands of people, all ages, standing in silent awe as they watch a man go into a tent over here. As he walks in, a cloud comes and settles on the tent and everybody's standing in silent awe because there is a man who is meeting with God. This is one of those places, all right, we just can't leave this in the Old Testament because uh, this is where we realize like, we haven't gathered together tonight to watch somebody go into a tent. Like, anybody can go into the tent. <laughs> Who can go into the tent? And then that is even better than that. You don't have to go into a tent. You are the tent. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Like, you are the tent. <laughs> this is awesome. Like what Old Testament saints only could have longed for. You and I have the privilege of experience before we even get out of bed in the morning. I just land there like I'm in the, I'm the tent. I'm like dwelling with you, God, right now. Like, oh. We pray because we have a privilege we can't forsake. We pray because we have a family we can't forget. So praise him. Moses prays not just for God's presence to go with him, but with them, with the entire people of God. It's not just about us, it's about 
Our need for God's help as his people together. We pray because we have a God we cannot fathom. I love Exodus 33, 18. After praying for God to relent his wrath, go with his people into this promised land. At that point, you think Moses would be content. Like, call it a day, good day in the tent. Not Moses. Moses stays in the tent. Listen to what he says to God. Moses said, please show me your glory. Are you kidding me? I think about one moment, this is the guy who got to speak with God in a burning bush. He saw God split a sea right in half between his eyes. So he struck a rock and water came out. He prayed and bread fell down from heaven. This is a man when everybody else was warned to stay away from the mountain, he got to go up on the mountain and meet with God. If anybody had seen the glory of God, it was Moses. So please show me your glory. Really? Here's the deal. He wanted more. Apparently, when you taste the glory of God, you have an insatiable desire for more and more and more. This is why we pray. So if we're not praying, what are we saying? We're praying, we're saying with our lives, when we're not praying, we're content with little knowledge of his glory. Like, may that not be the commentary in our lives. Like, we, we pray because we want to see, we want to know, we want to enjoy more and more and more of God's glory in our lives, in his church, in the world around us. So this is how Jesus will teach us to pray, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, we want to see your glory in greater and greater ways in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our countries, in the world. We want to see your glory. Please show us your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Yes. Number 11. 11. We got so far to go. All right, the effect of fasting. All right, the effect of fasting. Let's go really quick here. Exodus 34, 28. Let's get to the Pentateuch. Uh, Exodus 34, 28 talks about a miraculous fast from Moses from food and water. Miraculous, the key word. So this was 40 days, not normal or physically possible without divine intervention. A divine feast on God's word and prayer, communion with God. And the effect was evident in Moses' shining face. Here's the picture we got to see. We'll see all over scripture. The more we pursue God in all of his glory, the more we reflect God's glory in every facet of our lives. We can't help but to become like what we behold. It's kind of like kids. Like the more my kids are around me, the more they act like me. They take on some of my mannerisms. What comes out of their mouths reflects what comes out of my mouth, like for better or for worse. They react like I do. They become like what they behold. So the more you fix your eyes, your heart, your mind, your attention, your affections on Jesus, the more you will become like him. It's exactly what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The more we behold Jesus, the more we become like Jesus. The more we behold the glory of God, the more we will reflect the character of God. So God, please help us to behold you, to know you and love you more and more and more. And in this, cause our lives and our churches to be more and more a reflection of your character and your love and your holiness and your compassion and your care and your justice and your mercy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One more passage in Exodus, the purpose of salvation. This is the big picture point we need to see in the book of Exodus. God saves his people from captivity so they might seek his face in worship. You, you look at all these verses that I put, they all describe the why of the Exodus. Why did God deliver his people out of slavery so that they might serve or worship him at Mount Sinai? Pharaoh, let my people go so they may hold a feast to me of worship in the wilderness. You see this over and over and over again. We won't read all those verses. And you think about, oh man, there's so much good here. You just think about worship at creation in the first part of Genesis. Dwelling place of God was Eden where Adam and Eve enjoyed God's presence and all of creation reflected God's glory. But then sin entered the world, messed up the whole picture. So how would God dwell upon his people, among his people now? And that's what we see in the last half of Exodus. Think about worship at Mount Sinai. The dwelling place of God becomes the tabernacle. The last half of Exodus, really starting in Exodus 25, constrains, contains instructions for building the tabernacle, which literally means dwelling place, the place where God will dwell among his people. And it's interesting. You look back at Genesis 1, you see seven distinct creative acts, all of them prefaced by the words, and God said. I list them all there. Then when you get to Exodus 25, you see the instruction of the tabernacle. You'll never guess how many times we see the phrase, God or the Lord said to Moses. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. And it's interesting, back in Genesis 2, after God said the last thing he did, he rested on the Sabbath. So now, look at what happens in Exodus 31. Right after the seventh time we see the Lord said, it says, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. This is not accidental. This is intentional. This is God saying, in Exodus, I'm forming a new creation. I'm dwelling among my people again. Obviously, it's different from Eden because man is separated from the inner place, the most holy of holies, where God's presence dwells in the tabernacle. And we see in Exodus 25 that the presence of God is guarded by cherubim on either side, which remember at the end of Genesis 3, what guarded the entrance to Eden, where the presence of God dwell? Cherubim. So the whole picture there, original creation, symbolized in this picture of the tabernacle, a little piece of heaven on earth, a visible picture of God dwelling among his people, made possible by sacrifice. So Aaron would enter into God's presence and offer Sacrifices, this is where, and this is where we see Exodus ends in chapter 40 with Israel following God's glory in this tent. God saves his people from captivity so that they might seek his face and worship and follow him wherever he leads for the spread of his glory. This is big. 
Like, Christian, why have you been saved? Why have you been saved from your sin? God saves you from your sin, why? God saves you so that you might seek him in worship and follow him wherever he leads for the spread of his glory among the nations. That, that's what Exodus is teaching us. God, help us to see it. This is why we've been saved, to pursue you, to praise you, to serve you, to follow you wherever, however you lead us for the spread of your glory in the world. So please cause the purpose of your salvation to be fulfilled in us. Teach us to seek your face and follow your leadership for your glory. That leads to Leviticus. How can people in their sinfulness commune with God in this holiness? God is ho- make, Leviticus made clear, God is holy. We cannot be casual with God. We must be contrite before God. We must be contrite before God. Sin is deadly. We're given that reminder with Nadab and Abihu, struck down. Sin is deadly. And we see this all over Leviticus. The propensity to sin is strong. The punishment for sin is severe. Leviticus 24, people put to death for blaspheming God's name. Sin is no small thing in the sign of a holy God, which means sacrifice is necessary. The payment for sin and death must be doled out, which is why we have an emphasis on sacrifice in Leviticus on an ongoing basis. We'll just fly through this. God's provision in the Old Testament was an annual sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. The elements involved were a priest entering an earthly sanctuary where he offered the blood of a spotless animal as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And in that picture, God saw the sins of Israel. God was satisfied by the sacrifice of a substitute. And that was a sacrifice that would need repeating year after year after year. The effect of that was a reminder of all our sin year after year after year, which all sets the stage for the New Testament where we find an abiding sacrifice in the death of Christ. The elements now, a priest entering a heavenly sanctuary. And the offering is not a spotless animal, but the blood of a sinless man. And through the shedding of Jesus' blood on a cross for us, God sees the sin in our lives, and God is satisfied by the sacrifice of his son. And that's a sacrifice that will last forever. The effect is not a reminder of our sins. It is the removal of all our sin through what Jesus did on the cross for us. Because of his once-for-all sacrifice, our guilt is gone, and our conscience is clear. So Hebrews 10 says, let us then draw near to God. Let's pray. Let's pursue God. Jesus made the way open for you and I to pursue God. So sinful people can only commune with the holy God through sufficient sacrifice, which means Jesus is our only hope of access to God, and Jesus is our constant and eternal advocate before God. Check this out in Hebrews 7. The former priest, for many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Did you hear that? Not just about us praying, Jesus lives to intercede for you. Jesus is your great high priest at every moment. In every circumstance, every struggle you walk through, every trial, temptation you face, Jesus lives to intercede for you. Robert Murray McShane said, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Jesus, we praise you for this. We praise you for being our intercessor. We're praying everything in your name. We pray this in your name with honor and reverence and gratitude for your name, for you have made it possible to have access to the Father, and you are eternal advocate before the Father. All glory be to the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Numbers 9, God our guide. It just keeps getting better. Just like God promised in Exodus 40, Numbers 9 tells us that God is continually present with his people, giving constant guidance to his people. Constantly guiding his people. Numbers 11, 12, 14, 21, the power of intercession. You look at these stories of intercession, praying on behalf of others. Numbers 11, Moses pleads for God's righteous anger to relent again, and God answers by suspending judgment. In Numbers 12, God, Moses pleads for God's healing amidst Miriam's hurt, and God answers according to his holiness. Numbers 14, Moses pleads for God's mercy according to God's word, and God answers according to Moses' word. That's that phrase, I pardon according to your word. Numbers 14, verse 20. and Numbers 21, Moses pleads for God's grace on behalf of sinners. God answers by providing salvation. God help us to faithfully intercede for others. Then closing out the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy, love for God, the way to life. So here in Deuteronomy, we see the supreme command of all Scripture is to love the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Which Jesus says is the first and greatest commandment in Matthew 22. So we see all throughout Deuteronomy, exhortations for God, from God to his people to enjoy the gifts while they exalt the giver. But God constantly says, don't forget the giver. Which they do. In the same way we do. God gives money as a good gift. We forget him and we focus on money and we commit idolatry and materialism. God gives sex as a good gift and we forget him and his ways and his laws and focus on sex according to our ideas. We commit idolatry and sexual immorality. One by one by one, we enjoy, supposedly enjoy gifts, but not according to God's design and in a way that it totally ignores the giver. The supreme command of scripture is to love God 
over and above everything this world offers with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The clear charge is to hear the law of God, Deuteronomy 4. This is just over and over and over again all throughout Deuteronomy. Hear the law, hear the law. And the ultimate choice in the end is clear, death or life death or life. See, I've called heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. So that's the choice every one of us has. We want to live in the pursuit of God. Or we want to die not pursuing God. <laughs> so what we find here at the end of the Pentateuch is that the prophet Moses was un ultimately unable to bring life as he died because he was a sinner and he couldn't lead them into the promised land. Yet Moses points us to the greater prophet, Jesus, who is uniquely able to conquer death and give us life. Deuteronomy 18, I will raise up another prophet like you. Jesus, the great high priest and perfect prophet. Not just any priest, not just any prophet. God himself in the flesh will make the way for sinners to know, enjoy, and pursue him. That's a summary of what the Pentateuch teaches about prayer, fasting, and the pursuit of God. So God help us to choose life in the pursuit of you. Like we deserve separation from you, yet you have made restoration to you possible, and we praise you for that tonight. And we pray that you help us to take full advantage of it. And help us, oh God, to choose life, to listen to your law, and to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Like, may that be the commentary on my life. And the commentary on our lives all around the world gathered together right now. That we loved you with everything we are and everything we have. And that this love was evident for you in our pursuit of you. Teach us what that means the rest of our time together tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.